Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome back to Philippine X and Wellness. We're delighted to launch our first episode of season two, and we wanted to express our gratitude to our community for supporting us through our one year anniversary. Our opening track that you were just listening to is called Help Me. It's by Richie Ramirez. And as our season two opener, Philippine X and Wellness presents Occupational Therapy and Autism Acceptance with Dr. Arnel Calvario. My name's Safo. I use they, them, xia pronouns. I'm currently streaming from Chichen Ohlone territory, uh, so-called Oakland, California. My dad immigrated from Iloilo and my mom from Sambales, Philippines. And now I'd like to introduce my co-host, Ryan. Awesome. Thank you, Safo. Magandang gabi, kababayan, everyone, globally. Uh, my name is Ryan Loren, and my chosen pronouns are he, him, his. So I'm currently um, streaming from the ancestral lands of the still living, still sovereign, Munsi, Lanape, Lanape peoples, communities, nation here in West New York, New, uh, West New York, New Jersey, also Jersey City. Um, my father and mother um, immigrated from Manila back in the 70s. Um, and I'm so great to be here with you all. And I'd like to introduce our stage tech manager for this episode, Ms. Cheryl. Good day, everyone. Maayang Adlao. I'm Cheryl Samson Ramirez. My chosen pronouns are she, her, sha. I'm ethnically Visayan. My mom is from Misamis Occidental in Mindanao, and my dad is from Kapis on the island of Panay. I'm also a quarter Chinese and currently streaming from the traditional territories of the Tongva and Kich people, also known as Los Angeles. And I am passing it back to Safo to continue with our vision and disclaimer. Philippinex and Wellness's vision is to support the wellness of the Philippinex community through resource sharing, podcast streams, and partnerships with professionals and organizations in order to live healthier, happier, and more, more fulfilling lives. If you're not already following us, please follow us at Philippinex in Wellness, P ending with an X in Wellness on IG, Facebook, YouTube, and on Twitter via the handle at PhilippineX, the letter N, the word well, followed by the letters N and S. We honor the safe space by asking everyone to speak and listen respectfully from your heart throughout our time together tonight. This pre-recorded session can be accessed through um, access through our Philippine X and Wellness uh, and SoCal Filipinos YouTube channels and on Apple Podcasts. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com, Philippine X in Wellness. We'd like to give a heartwarming thank you to our supporters for helping reach our 100 subscriber milestone, which really helped and enabled us to acquire our own channel domain. Awesome. So cool, y'all. As we always, as always to our listeners, we'll be sure to share any questions that you may have um, front-loaded from our team with any of our episodes. So please keep in mind that anything that is discussed today obviously is only for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to be medical advice. Always, always consult with your healthcare practitioner for any particular in um, any particular condition, especially before starting any new exercise or health program. Philippine X in Wellness was formed to provide a dialogue around topics that affect the wellness of our Philippine X community. We're also here to highlight Philippine X individuals and organizations that are actively doing wellness work. Without further ado. Today's guest speaker is Dr. Arnel Calvario. 
Believing in using his talents and resources to promote community outreach, respect for all people, artistic expression and education, Dr. Arnel Calvario has dedicated himself to the dance community since its college days. In 1992, he founded UC Irvine's own Cava Modern. He currently serves as a board president of Culture Shock International and as an active member of the Kinjas. He managed Cava Modern, Fanny Pack, The Beat Freaks, and Kinjas during their runs on MTV's hit show Americans, America's Best Dance Group. Arnell also helped manage Kinjas during, during their 2017 run on NBC's World of Dance. He also launched his dance therapy program for neurodivergent children in April 2014 in collaboration with Culture Shock LA and the DEA. He also continues to teach his Roots Before Branches dance workshop and his international virtual program, Leadership Tools for the Dance Leader. Judge dance competitions, speak on discussion panels, and participate in program development and leadership mentorship internationally. He does all this while continuing to work as a full-time pediatric doctor of occupational therapy for Long Beach Unified School District related services. We would like to welcome to Philippine X in Wellness for the first time, Dr. Arnel Calvario. Hi, Arnel. Hi, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> um, I guess I should introduce that my chosen pronouns are he, him, his, and I am uh, tuning in from, Occup and, uh, from occupied lands of the Tongva and Keys people, um, aka Long Beach, California. So, happy to be here. Awesome. All right. I mean... Dr. Arnell, Arnell, um, that was such, oh my goodness, that's such a great bio. Like, tell us, how do you do it all? Like, tell us your secrets and like how you're able to balance everything. You know, we've also found that this episode will be aired on your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, well, one thing I've always really um, believed that we're all like an extraordinary, we're all a mosaic of many extraordinary parts. So we're not really just one thing. Uh, when we embrace all the different uh, parts of us um, and all the different things that make us, you know, unique and, and happy and healthy, then then we, it, it shows up, right, in, in how we live. So, um, so how I do it is I just commit to the things I love and that align with my purpose. Um, and I'm always paying attention to that work-life balance. Um, and, you know, work, work, rest, and play. <laughs> that, that balance of all three. And um, I, I've always been good at the work part, but the rest and play is something that in later years, um, I figured how to, how to do better. So, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So great. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we'll... I want to wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're really so happy to just really gift you this episode to you, all of your loved ones um, in your life, especially in celebration of your birthday, right? So um, let's start off, you know, just to really kick things off. Um, as we always ask our guests at the beginning of our every episode, um, you're from LA, um, but we'd like to go deeper. Like, where um, where in the Philippines are you family from? Uh, so my mom's side is from Kalibo Aklan, uh, so they're Visayan, um, and then in in my co in her college years, my mom went to. Uh, uh, to uh, Quezon City, and so spent some of uh, all of those later years in her twenties, going into her thirties there before she immigrated to the U.S. with her sister. Um, my dad is from Quezon Province, um, uh, so that's it's really been amazing to actually be able to grow up visiting both 
um, region, you know, Quezon province and Aklan, and kind of experience both that city life and the provincial life, because they're both just so amazing and we can learn so much from both, you know? Um, so it's been really amazing uh, to kind of grow up experiencing both. And especially in Aklan too, it was nice to be able to have experience at Atihan there a couple of times, um, which is just a big celebration in my mom's hometown, as well as in my dad's hometown, um, visit all the different like farmlands and literally be right next to like caribou <laughs> and um yeah, just experience like what it's like to live, you know, the, like that uh, provincial interconnected community, you know, kind of living. So, yeah, that's kind of like where my parents grew up. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I know I mentioned Manila. So my mom is uh, originally from 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 Manila, Makati, but my dad is from Quezon City. So nice. being able to visit Quezon City has been just pretty amazing growing up as well that's awesome yeah and i love makati actually because i i go to the philippines like um, almost before pandemic <laughs> yeah. I, i've been going to the philippines one to twice one to two times a year to teach you know workshops and you know education and lead, dance education and leadership workshops and i always stay in makati actually so i love it there <laughs> awesome i'm definitely due i'm definitely due for a visit for sure mm -hmm. yes I love Makati too. Um, I feel like I prefer it over Manila sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah, and my dad lived there um, to work after he moved from Iloilo. So, yeah. I also heard that you're from Carson, right, Arno? The South yeah. Bay. Yeah. That's where I grew up. <laughs> yeah, South Bay. <laughs> yeah, I grew up right next to the 405. <laughs> I grew up um, in Harbor City, like right next to the 110. Oh, right. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think both of us live at that intersection of 405 mm -hmm. and 110, right? Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, as we open up this episode, it's in alignment with uh, April also being Occupational Therapist and Autism Acceptance Month. So um, can you start off by explaining to our listeners uh, who don't know what the field of occupational therapy is? And um, what's been your journey? Yeah, sure. Um, so occupational therapy is um, it's a, a therapy field that basically believes in helping people, um, whether it's healing or progressing through, you know, whether it's a physical challenge or a, a cognitive or mental or emotional challenge, um, get better and be able to return to activities that occupy your time. And when we think about activities, like meaningful activities. So, uh, for example, I think it's always easier to kind of describe it like as an example. So, you know, um, for example, you know, I've worked with patients before who have had a spinal cord injury where, you know, uh, they lost, you know, function of half their body. Um, and so my job is, first of all, to find out what was your life like, you know, before you got to this hospital? Um, and what did you do day to day? What are the things that are important to you day to day? And then once they share that with me, and we're not just talking about work, right? We're talking about like, what did you do every day of your life? Okay, I get up, I brush my teeth, I put on, I take a shower, I put on my clothes and I have make my breakfast. Then I do this hobby or that hobby and then I go to work. Uh, then I come home, right? So I get a detailed account from, you know, my patient or the family. And then it's my job to help them get stronger physically, emotionally, and spiritually so they can get back to doing, to living life and, and doing all those things that occupy a person's time meaningfully. So my work is really cool because uh, it operates out, out of the three philosophies or three uh, sciences. So biology, psychology, and sociology. And so... Yeah, like if a person isn't able to use their, their legs, um, I'll teach them ways to still put on their clothes. And, but we, it just they can still live, but it's just going to be a different way, right? Or I might look at their house and be like, you know what? You can All of this is great, but let's just move everything a little bit closer down. So when you use your wheelchair, you can reach everything. When you're in bed, you can reach over easily, right? So the, the cool thing about occupational therapy is it's very personalized. 
it's holistic um and it's 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 definitely in line with the other therapy fields we usually collaborate with physical therapists um, speech language therapists um, social workers psychologists we all work together to really like advocate for you know our patients to return to a healthy meaningful life right so I love it. It's it's a uh, it's perfect for an artist that loves health and wellness, right? Because you can use that creativity of an artist and put it together with science to help people, you know, recover and get better. So, yeah, it sounds like you're really meeting people where they are, uh, depending on like case by case, like what yeah. they need in that moment and as they recover. Um, I can see how that could be really creative and that it could be very fulfilling, especially as an artist to like be creative of what they need. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, work with all other like different kinds of health providers. Yeah. Um, the collaboration is really, really fun because <laughs> like, like for example, in that case, the physical therapist would help them, you know, get into their wheelchair, move themselves around, you know, get, get stronger. Um, and the speech therapist is going to work on communication. Yeah, maybe some of your vocal cords are in, were affected in this injury, but you can still communicate. This is how you're going to talk. This is how you're going to use gestures. And then I'm the activity person. All the things you do, we're going to figure out how you're going to do it. You know? And then all together, we're working towards function independence and being meaningfully happy, right? Uh, so I love it. Yeah, I love my field. And there's so much diversity. So some OTs work in mental health specifically. Some work um, at the gym. <laughs> some do ergonomic training. Like, okay, in your work, this is we're, we're, this is how you're gonna set up your office so you have less injuries. Um, or like myself, I work in the school system, so I work with kids on how they're gonna access the playground, their classroom, bathroom, you know, their lunch. I'm working how they play. You know, basically all those things you do in school, those occupations you do in school it's my job to build their skills so they can do all those things so yeah <laughs> that's cool that's really cool I, I i like how you had mentioned earlier that it's it's multidisciplinary right because you yeah. listed that you're able to there's the three pillars or three disciplines that you're able to follow through in terms yeah. of your your overall work so that you're able to be like how you mentioned very diversified in terms of the things that you're able to do on a day-to-day -day basis i i also love the fact that you um kind of are able to piece things together right in terms of the day-to-day -day. yeah kind of like bringing that back to home in terms of looking at your your clients before you know before coming into your scope being able to just kind of like piece those things together, whereas some um, some other dis disciplines aren't able to do that, right? Yeah, that's the psychosocial piece that I love because when I was, oh, I, I, you asked me about my journey, like, you know, because before I was going to be a physical therapist, I was going to be a pediatrician. Um, but, and it's like, those are built off the, the medical biology model, right? But I always love psychology and sociology, the psychosocial. Like, what are your human stories? How does it fit in, not just in front of me, but into your community, into your home, into your family and friends? You know, I, I want to know those things before I even develop a treatment plan. Uh, and that's just really kind of missing in a lot of disciplines. And they're, all the disciplines are amazing, but that is one of the unique facets of occupational therapy that I absolutely, that made the decision where I was gonna go physical therapy or occupational therapy. It ended up being occupational therapy because of that psychosocial piece, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool to hear how you were able to pivot and just really follow through with what speaks, you know, that speaks to you. Yes. That's cool. Yes. So let's, um, let's dive a little bit deeper. Yeah, I got one for you. So, you know, as as we look really deeper into your your bio, um, and obviously we're connecting the dots. We're um, in connecting it with. Obviously, this is Autism Acceptance Month. Um, you mentioned developing, you know, dance therapy program for neurodivergent children, and really working for 
I get this right, LBUSDs related services. So let's dive deeper in that. For starters, like if you could just really help our listeners globally and understand, um, you know, obviously if they're unaware of what this all means, what is considered neurodivergent and then followed by that categorized as related services in your school district. So kind of like guide us through that flow. And yeah, so I, I mean, it's really amazing because like we have so much more vocabulary now, even just in the last like five, 10 years. And so, um, you know, some of the uh, former language were high functioning autism, low functioning autism, you know what I mean? These kind of like hierarchical um, type type of labels <laughs> that we put on an autistic person. Um, and the movement has changed so much moving in the direction of neurodiversity. So just knowing that um, while there is the typical neuro neurological development, there's also a brilliant diversity where, you know, certain parts of the brain are hyper-developed and with e extraordinary talents, you know, and then other parts of the brain may be, you know, a little bit delayed or there may be some challenges, but the combination of that is, is, is still like builds brilliant diversity in our world. And so um, a lot of the changes happened in recent years, just in the recent five years. So even um, having uh, autism, it used to be Autism Awareness Month until the movement in the community, especially adults and living with autism or parents of, of autistic people, they really wanted it. They said awareness is, was only the beginning, but it's really about moving towards acceptance because acceptance is, is embracing them as, as, as one of us, right? It's just diversity, right? So I even loved how Ryan, you you made it, or this program just made it a point to to even call it as such autism acceptance because that's really where we want to go. Autism acceptance, autism appreciation. We just want to really embrace our autistic uh, family all around the world as 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 equal <laughs> to all of us. But it is neurodivergent because. Um, it's not the typical neuro, neurological develop, development, um, so it's neurodivergent. It's just different than typical. Um, but we, when we look at you know neurotypical and neurodivergent together, that's neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then I think you're asking about you're asking about related services. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can kind of like. Um, you know, go a little bit deeper in terms of related services, uh -huh. um, in terms of like your day to day, especially when you're working in like school districts. So yeah, network. So um, I've been working in pediatrics for occupational therapy for 20 years. It's actually my 20 year anniversary this uh, last month. <laughs> so since I've been a licensed occupational therapist and I spent um, my beginning years um, at Children's Hospital LA on the rehab unit. So doing kind of the similar thing that I just described, you know, with kids who, um, you know, are battling cancer or, you know, um, recovering from spinal cord injuries or spina bifida or, you know, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and then, you know, after a while, I wanted to kind of return back to the community because I, although I love the hospital setting and I learned a lot, um, I wanted to be in community and I wanted to see daylight <laughs> outside the hospital walls and also to be super frank, uh, honest. Um, I got attached to a lot of the on kids with in you know, the oncology kids and so the kids from the oncology department. And so, you know, when I lost, you know, almost 20 kids to cancer after they had already survived it, then you bond with the families and then they pass away. I realized that my skin was a little bit too thin because, you know, um, I just get attached. So I needed to move in another direction that where I'm still helping people, but maybe I'm not uh, dealing with, you know, children, you know, unfortunately passing away. Uh, so I made it over to the district. And so you know, occupational therapy is in the hospitals, but occupational therapists are also in the school districts. And um, so I work in three different school sites, 
helping um, doing evaluations for kids to see if they need occupational therapy services. And also if I qualify them, then I also deliver those services as well. Um, so it's kind of cool because you're kind of the gatekeeper and the advocate for all of these kids' needs. And, you know, while I was um, collaborating with nurses at Children's Hospital LA, now I'm collaborating with teachers and principal, you know, and social workers, which is like super amazing as well. Um, and it's nice because I'm, you know, making my schedule, I have my own clinic. Um, and so I, I really love it um, because I'm working, I'm mainly working on three main things. I'm working on sensory integration. So a lot of our kids different with different diagnoses have um, trouble regulating sensory experiences. I'm working on motor skills. So things that they will need to be able to do use a pencil, use a marker, use scissors, right, at school, uh, play on the playground, open up their um, lunch pail, right, put on their zip sweater, right, all of those fine motor skills that they're going to need to do those things. And then I'm also um, working sometimes on visual perception. So how are they using their eyes to navigate across the environment? You know, do they have problems paying with visual attention? Do they have problems seeing the paper? Do they have problems seeing the board? You know, how can I help them? And so I'm being creative in, um, you know, creating these therapies to build those skills. And I'm also going into the classrooms, um, collaborating with the teachers as, oh, I think that this, they need this. Their body needs to move around a little bit. So we're going to put a little cushion on his chair so he can still get the movement and still pay attention to you and calm and regulate his body so he can still uh, pay attention to your lesson. And then working with parents too. And uh, hey, this worked at school. You might want to try that at home when they're doing homework, you know. Um, so it's really, really fun. And um, I've been at, for Long, at the Long Beach Unified School District now for 15 years. Uh, and yeah, I love it. I love also being on the school schedule, which is really help my self-care and wellness practices, right? So um, moving from the hospital to the district has also even supported that. It's like a win-win in all directions. Um, but one of the things you asked earlier was related, what does related services mean? Uh, related services are um, a lot of these supportive services that are available to all children at school if they qualify. So usually when, um, for example, if a kid, if a, if a parent uh, notices that a kid is having, you know, sensory issues, like a picky eater or problems paying attention, possibly ADHD, um, the, you know, problems with their fine motor skills, it's like really, really delayed and they're not, and, or maybe they're not speaking, their language hasn't come along and they're not talking and they're like two or three years old. Um, then they're going to usually do two things. They're going to, one, they're probably going to get an evaluation from their physician, like a neurological evaluation. And then when they, um, when they get that neurological evaluation, sometimes it comes up that maybe they're autism, they have autism, right? Uh, and at that point, if they have that diagnosis from the doctor, they can bring that to the school and the school psychologist will evaluate, um, you know, to see what the problems are. And if they qualify, then they get the related services. And the related services will be occupational therapy, possibly, or physical therapy, adaptive PE, all these various services uh, that are offered through the district for free um, for um, any kid that's in the public school uh, system. And but this is in California. So, um, and actually most districts across the country, they, they can have it for free, which is really, really nice. Um, so that's kind of the department I'm in because, you know, I, if I evaluate them and they need it, then I'll deliver it as part of the related services. Yeah. That's that's amazing. Thank thank you for for diving deeper in that and being able to really give us your scope of of work. You know, going from the hospital, um, following your journey back into um, going into the school services and being able to provide you know that extra touch, that extra care, that extra detail to all of your students that, that you come across. So 
It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Arnell. <laughs> Yeah, and also one thing I learned, even even after being a um, occupational therapist for so long, it's like you're always learning. Uh, you're also learning what you need to also unlearn, right? So in school, I learned that you always use people first language for any diagnosis. So you know, a child with spina bifida, a child with Down syndrome, a child with autism. Uh, but what I really realized in this last year, as we're really understanding like diversity, we really need to actually look less at the textbooks and actually look at the communities themselves. And what I learned about the autistic community is they like they don't like people people first um, language. They want they are very proud of their neurodiversity, and they have empowered the word autistic to be something great. And so they prefer to be addressed as an autistic child, an autistic adult, right? I'm autistic, right? And there would be nothing wrong with that. That's something to be proud of. And that's something I learned. So I actually threw out people first language now at, I, at, at our team meetings, uh, at my interactions with parents, because I realized that they, when you ask the community themselves, this is what they want. And so now I'm learning that every community is different you know like some love people first language like the down syndrome uh the uh children with down syndrome or parents of children with down syndrome they, love, they like people first language but the autistic community likes autistic as you know as something to be um super proud of and to be empowered by so that's something interesting that i'm even learning and i kind of look forward to just learning more terminology as as things as people progress as we as a people progress to really affirm people uh, in the way they want to be affirmed and addressed right so yeah i think this is all just learning for all, like our team and our listeners to to really hear you define neurodiversity and using people first language and we're really appreciative to have you on to really break that down to all of us I also know, um, Arnell, that you mentioned spina bifida, or maybe can you explain what that is also for maybe our, our audience that might not know what that is? Yeah, that's um, that's actually um, uh, another diagnosis where um, the spine actually um, at birth is formed differently. And so, and a lot of it is usually in the lower spine. So a lot of our um, sometimes in the lower and the upper spine. So sometimes there's like, you know, um, uh, development, brain development um, that's affected and sometimes it's lower body. So maybe they're not able to walk or maybe they have some urinal tract um, difficulties. So, and every kid with spina bifida is different so, uh, where the, the growth is different. Um, so you kind of have to really look at everything the doctor lays out. But um, I work with a lot of kids with spina bifida at Children's Hospital LA, and it's been really cool to address. I, I worked with a lot of teenagers uh, to be able to address not just the normal things of using the bathroom, um, using a wheelchair, putting on your clothes, but even things like using public transportation, <laughs> you know what I mean, to go out with their friends. Um, even some I've had to kind of really look into intimacy. What, what does that look like, you know, for them as, you know, teenagers and young adults. So, um, so yeah, spina bifida is another area of practice that I, I was passionate about and yeah, it's really, really cool. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's really great to, again, hear all, all of the work that occupational therapists do to really advocate for different able-bodied uh, people. And, and sometimes some of us also take these things for granted. So uh, we're really lucky to have you on you know, our platform to really talk about the importance of celebrating occupational therapists, not just for the month of April, but really explaining to folks that may need these types of resources, what's available to them. And I think when we were planning for this episode, I was um, sharing with you all that I, I actually didn't really fully know what an occupational therapist did, even though my god sister is an occupational therapist. And uh, for me personally, I had shared that um, when my dad's health started to decline, um, I actually brought in 
you know, I met, I had lunch with my god sister and her husband, who is also a director in occupational therapy, and told them some of the things that were happening with my dad in terms of immobility. He was sleeping more and um, sitting more, and I was able to actually benefit from some of their recommendations. So, you know, during lunch, they were, I guess, they were just doing this um, in person. In person, uh, I guess, in person and in personal assessments, I guess, uh, you know, or casual assessments of what was going on with my dad at the time. And they came over, looked at our house, looked at looked at what our he frequented, you know, the restroom that he frequented normally. Um, saw this rug that my mom had on the floor and was like, "Oh, that's really um, uh, prone to like." your dad sleeping if he's uses a restroom during the middle of the night and these were like things that I hadn't even thought about you know or have you thought about a shower bar for your dad when he takes baths and I didn't even consider all of these different angles that they were bringing in and so I was really grateful to have that personal experience to even know that an OT can play a role even in the later stages of, of life especially for for some of us that are in that sandwich generation or dealing with aging parents. Yeah. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about, um, you know, OTs and, and those types of roles as well. Yeah. I mean, it's the whole lifespan from infants to, you know, to uh, those later years. And yeah, you have OTs who just specialize in that, like kudos to your relative, you know, for like seeing the importance of that because, it's really all about like when things are different, um, not giving up, but using creativity and knowledge to almost reimagine and recreate a future, right? And 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 have believe that there is hope, and that you may you 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 can still live. You might need to live a little differently, um, but we got each other. We're gonna figure it out together. And it, it's always more than just even the OT and the patient. It's like what you said. It's the OT, the patient, and his whole ecosystem, right? So whoever lives with him, which was obviously you. So. Um, you know, who are in their life, in their social life, and how do we work together? And so I always love that too, um, because sometimes in the medical model, it can be more like a hierarchy. So the doctor tells you what you need to do, and then you need to get out of here really quick. You know what I mean? Um, whereas you have people like social workers like you, Cheryl, and, you know, um, people who really want to know more, so could really figure this out in a personal and meaningfully impactful way. And I think that's what's really, really cool about these, uh, a field like occupational therapy is um, is it, it really goes deep, yeah. And it really makes you feel like a human being versus a number, you know what I mean? So, yeah, and sure. I love the idea of hope, <laughs> right? Is that your job is to, to work together to cultivate and spark hope, you know, so I like that. I just also love the idea to know that we could walk through this world, not alone, but actually with a team, right? And that's really from childbirth to the later stages of our life. And so it's really helpful to to hear you speak about, you know, there there's a team, there's like the OT, there's a physical therapist, there's a social worker, because even sometimes culturally or, you know, within our culture, you know, our, our parents are always pushing us to be doctors or nurses or, yeah. you know, but there's also this other part of the team that's essential to um, our well-being and our health. And so it's, it's great to hear that the OT is another person to consider as, that could be part of your team. And and with that, I just wanted to say, you know, I know that we're really thankful to have you here and especially during your birthday month and <laughs> Um, you know, this has been an informative first half of our episode so far, just hearing all the gems that you've been dropping and, and really articulating the work that you do and the communities that you advocate for. So thank you all for joining us for season two of Philippine X and Wellness. We're talking with Dr. Arnel Calvario, occupational therapist, dancer extraordinaire, and overall exceptional human being. Don't go away. Feel free to take a quick stretch, refill your water or tea. We'll be right back after this break.
Welcome back to Philippinex and Wellness. You were just listening to the track Spring by our very own in-house designer, Richie. You can also listen to Richie's EP called Faces Volume 1 on Bandcamp and follow him on Instagram at Rich Ramirez Art. Um, I actually met Cheryl through Richie and I also learned that Cheryl met Arnell through Richie. So it seems like he's mm -hmm. the connector here. Um, so returning from our break, we've been talking with Dr. Arnel Calvario about occupational therapy and neurodivergent or autistic individuals. So, Dr. Uh, Calvario, as we were preparing for this episode, we joked how this is going to be one of the few interviews with you out there uh, with the focus not being primarily based on dance. <laughs> um, yes. but, but we know from your bio alone how instrumental dance has been in your life and how you've even in integrated it into your career and your Instagram, not to mention <laughs> the, the, the dance reels you've done with your fiance, Justin. So shout out to Justin, who's mm -hmm. probably also listening right now. Uh, uh, tell us more about the dance therapy program that you launched for uh, neurodivergent children. I know we mentioned that. And we heard a little bit about that in your bio. Yeah, so Culture Shock LA, and that's where I met Richie. You know, Richie is actually one of the most talented b-boys, house dancers, overall dancers I've ever met in my entire dance career. Um, and also one of the homies, of course. <laughs> um, but Culture Shock LA, um, you know, uh, I took over Culture Shock LA in 2003, and our commitment was to doing after-school programs and doing youth dance programs to really use um dance you know whether that's hip-hop or club styles or street styles to really uplift educate empower you know um kids of all backgrounds right and so um we got successful with that you know over the years and then our like i mentioned like you mentioned earlier around 2014 i started noticing that a lot of autistic children who were talented at my schools were getting turned away from dance studios because people were afraid of them being different or they felt like they were maybe unteachable which is totally untrue um, and I realized like whoa you know I've been doing dance I'm doing occupational therapy at the same time <laughs> you know as my combination of you know what's right for me career-wise uh, maybe it's time for congruence you know maybe it's time to bring those worlds together to meet a need that just hasn't been met yet and so I reached out to Culture Shock and said hey Allison Tanaka she's the executive director right now of Culture Shock also a friend of Richie's <laughs> and you, Cheryl. Um, yeah, I asked her, I was like, would you support a dance therapy program that's basically a combination of dance workshops with my occupational therapy background to um, provide a service to neurodivergent children, you know, um, whether it's developmental delay or autistic children, right? And so most of, I would say about 80% of the kids I work with are autistic kids. So most of the kids in this dance therapy program were autistic children. And I noticed, you know, yes, we need to do some sensory warm ups to warm up their body and minds. And then, and then we teach them the dance. Then we give them another sensory break with, you know, freestyle cipher, right? Then we learn a little bit more and maybe you learn some, so practice some social skills. And then we put it all together and I realized, although, you know, we had to te do it, you know, really personalize how they learn these routines, once it's in their brains, their memory is pristine. They even realized, they even knew the details of these routines better than I would remember it sometimes because they <laughs> pay attention to all of those concrete details, you know. Uh, one thing I think a lot of people don't realize is um, children with autism, for the most part, their right brain may be smaller and underdeveloped, but their left brain is almost adult size. So what that means is once the information's in there, anything concrete, like that's why they're usually good at math computation. They're really good at reading, possibly, you know, deciphering words. Um, they're, once it gets in their memory, they remember every detail to the T. 
And wow. so what we started noticing is these kids, yeah, we had to find out a different way to get them to learn these routines. But once they learned it, they were amazing. <laughs> they were amazing. And also because they're completely free and liberated, you know, by nature, those freestyles were really special. They deserve that chance to just be free and, you know, let let people know how they're experiencing music and, and the stories inside their soul that they just wanted to, to share with the world. So Culture Shock always supported, like we would do the after school program for eight to 10 weeks. And then whenever Culture Shock would have their annual benefit show, they would actually invite my, my dancers to open the entire show. And so you would see over the years, these parents crying because they've never seen their child on the stage. They didn't think that was possible. And that's when I realized experiences like these, whether it's dance therapy or art therapy or music therapy, you know, done in the right way is very liberating and affirming, not just only for these brilliant, amazing children, but also for their families and their ecosystems, you know, and it 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 basically helps people um, learn what's possible and also maybe unlearn the limitations that they thought goes with when what you consider an autistic person, you know. Um, sometimes culturally, when we think about mental health issues or physical issues, there's that, that stigma of less than or their life is not going to be this is what's not possible for them any longer but what we're learning now and what we're advocating for now is when you create like unique programs like this dance therapy program um it unlocks what is possible and breaks down those stigmas so that people realize maybe they're going to learn a different way but maybe when they when you meet them where they are you're going to see something even better than what you imagined could be right so so yeah, so I love it, okay. and um, yeah, that's beautiful, <laughs> bro. You know, we're we're trying. My hope is to teach it so then, and there's a lot more dancers going to occupational therapy now that they're discovering what it is. And so, what started off as just mentoring like two or three dancers, uh, now I've mentored over thirty, <laughs> and some of them are practicing OTs now. Some of them are in OT currently, in OT school currently. Um, but by the time all of these brilliant dancers are done with school, my hope is that I'm going to just be a spark uh, to help other people create, you know, these art therapy programs that can serve communities all over the country and hopefully eventually all over the world in their own way, you know. So I hope that we move in that direction of possibility and hope and seeing what we can learn, you know, from our autistic family all over the world, right? Our autistic family, right? So we'll see. That's that's awesome. I, I, I love how you have created models, processes, and being able to kind of leave this legacy program for everybody that you have come in contact with um, from from your clients, students, patients, to even the people that are part of your program and being able to kind of like spread their wings and be able to be their own spheres of influence and being able to impact um, other people. That's definitely amazing. And seeing that transference of hope from, from you onto everybody that you've been able to impact. So that's, it's quite amazing. I, I, I love that. Oh, thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I feel like I hope that as a community in the world, we get away from that crap mentality of like, I'm going to create my program, but it's just going to be my own only, you know, because I don't want competition. The needs of the world are bigger than one person and one community. The needs of the world is so much. That's what we learned last year, right? That there's so much need. So I hope instead of that crab mentality, we have more of that collaboration and that support and that encouragement, you know, uh, to see like innovation uh, meet the needs of the world, you know. So, so yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. I've got, um, I've got two, kind of like a two-parter, right? So now that we are in 2022, right, it's, it's mm -hmm. April. Right. Yeah. Our world drastically changed March of 2020. Right. 
And so if you can speak to um, speak to us and, and our listeners globally, just the impact, right? You know, going from being in the classroom, being in the dance studios, being pretty much anywhere and everywhere, being able to make those impact and those changes. How did that, um, the circumstances that we all lived through, right? Yeah. Um, when March hit, how did you pivot and be able to still continue to do the work that you do with each and every one? Man, that was, I mean, everyone. The unique thing about that is everyone in the world was affected at the same time. Our experiences are very unique and different, but we all experienced something, right? Um, one thing I think it revealed was, well, first of all, we had to close down all the schools and we had not, you know, work was just on pause for a couple of weeks, but when it reopened, we couldn't go back to where we used to do everything. So I use a clinic and I work on the playground <laughs> with my kids because I'm working on skills, right? So it's not, it's in the clinic, it's in the classroom, it's at the lunch tables, you know, it's, you're using so many modalities that are more natural. And now I'm having to do all of that through a screen just like this. Um, and now I have to like task parents to be the hands that I usually am to support these children, whether it's holding their pencil correctly or getting their paper or materials or using toys or giving them jumping on the trampoline before we sit down to write so they get their energy and get that sensory need met. Um, and that was really hard. That's a big ask to ask parents to, to be that those hands while they're themselves going through this experience emotionally. And then they also are overwhelmed with being the teacher also and learning to be educators on top of all that. And some of them are also working at the same time, you know, and some of them have multiple children with special needs, you know, so um that was very difficult, not only for my work, but to also see so many families struggle. And there were times where I would just hold space for families that just need to cry, you know, mothers, fathers, just needing to cry. And I'm just like, you know what, this might be the work for now. I'm just going to hold space and let's like figure out a way to support you in this moment. And so that's hard because as much as I'm a human being, so you help and, you know, you can't help but tear up when you know you have this mother who's just doing the best she can and it's it's just so difficult so you know <laughs> then you go back to in person <laughs> um but you have to wear a mask and you know one kid at a time and you have to wash you know all of the the uh toys that are touched and they have to wash their hands before they come into the classroom and when they leave and you have to walk them to make sure they don't touch anything and they don't walk too close to other kids uh, we went through that phase, and then now we're at this phase, in at least in California, where op masks are optional, but we're still making personal choices as what as to what is safe for these kids. And so it, it was super challenging. But one of the things I love, okay, two things I loved were um, I've always felt that nurses and teachers are the heroes that never get the appreciation they deserve. And through this pandemic, we finally realized when we talk about frontline heroic workers, it was revealed that teachers and nurses are the heroes that always deserve to be centered and celebrated and appreciated. And so it took a whole fucking, oh, sorry, <laughs> it took a whole pandemic to like finally shine a light that we need to really beyond this moment we need to understand and, and never forget that they are the essential frontline heroes that often get shit on like straight up in the hospital setting they are often talked to in disrespectful ways by hi higher hierarchical you know systems uh, and also um, families, you know what I mean? And same thing with teachers, you know what I mean? The disrespect that they receive from administration or families themselves. I, I After this pandemic, I would say about 90% of all the parents I work with had a newfound respect for teachers <laughs> and what they do 
And also, you know, on the other end, we also got a newfound understanding and respect for what the families are going through at home because we got a peek into what their home life is also and what we got to understand their ecosystem even in a deeper way. Um, and the other thing I mentioned that I loved about the pandemic, I mean, I did not love the struggle. Nobody loved the struggle, but the byproduct of the struggle is we were reminded of the things that matter the most in our life. You know what I mean? Freedom, connection, right? Love, um, physical touch, you know what I mean? Things that, that we all take, we are all guilty of taking those things for granted. But after going through this pandemic, we've learned like the value of that and to never take it for granted again, right? Um, so hopefully we don't forget <laughs> as we're getting back into the, you know, um, slowly getting back into business as usual. And, you know, even though I don't think it'll ever be the same, I hope we don't forget those lessons that are just so vital and important. So we'll see. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. So I'm going to, um, I know I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll ask this question, right? And now that we're looking at um, kind of like the Philippine, the Philippine X community in its, you know, in its entirety, yeah. you know, we're looking at it from the lens of first, second generations here in the States and back in the Philippines, right? Yeah. Um you know, can you share with us like your insight in terms of families, you know, the ecosystems, the the how we come to terms when we are faced with children, adults, partners, family members that have, um, you know, that are autistic or have Down syndrome or, mm -hmm. you know, um, kind of talk about the the reality that we all face as Filipinos, right? Um, in terms of things that we grew up to be true, and un, you had mentioned earlier, unlearning to learn, right? In terms of how we see ourselves as a community, how we embrace it, how we shy away from it, how we not announce it, right? So, kind of share your perspective on on that piece. Yeah, I feel like it's too layered because we're dealing with shame, which is fortified by stigma. You know what I mean? The negative stigma of every different diagnosis, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, a physical challenge or it's something like, you know, autism, right? There's stigmas <laughs> in our culture that are attached to those. And with that is shame. And then when, and because of the shame, there's a lot of silence and then there's a lot of isolation, you know, for these families. And so I think that's one of the layers that need to be dispelled. And that's just not, that's not only in the Philippines, that's here as well. Um, but it's in, it's in all the communities from the Philippines to here. Um, so that's one challenge. Um, and then the other challenge is love languages, you know, to um, support and address the needs of anyone, you know, um, navigating, you know, life with an autistic, you know, child or autistic family member or, or friend or whatnot. Um, it's also like, like, I think I was mentioning this recently, um, that in Philippine culture, and uh, this is just my experience, <laughs> Uh, the dominant love languages are quality time and acts of service, right? Um, but maybe not so much um, words of affirmation. And so when we think about the need to support, you know, a parent of a child with autism, I mean, an autistic child, or how to support an autistic child or an autistic, or an, I would say just an autistic person, Um we're not so, it's not natural and just like part of our culture you know, first, firsthand to think about um, affirming words or offering support in our love in a way that's like affirming verbally and having these rich discussions verbally about our experiences and sharing and diving into these deep 
you know, conversations. Um, so I, I think we're progressing in that direction, um, definitely here. Um, but from what I hear from our relatives in the homeland, that's still hard. You know what I mean? Like talking about mental health issues, talking about um, physical or mental illness in general. Um, that's very difficult. Um, a lot of my friends back home and relatives still face like, oh, just keep it in the family, you know what I mean? Just like keep it quiet. Only we need to really know, you know what I mean? Uh, and there's still a lot of value placed on your name and your reputation and protecting the, the family image, right? But what we really need, what I really hope we'll move towards is celebrating diversity. And, you know, um, diversity is, it's brilliant, you know what I mean? And even though someone has unique challenges they also have unique brilliance and you and unique stories and that need to be celebrated and so i think when we think about art like filmmakers or educators like think at every aspect and every cornerstone of what we do if we start really including <laughs> neurodiversity in how we um, tell stories and celebrate stories, then maybe back home and here we'll have some progress, like dispelling stigma and maybe celebrating diversity. And maybe when we start to celebrate diversity more and have more understanding, then maybe there'll be more pathways for people to support and or more pathways for people to truly share their authentic experience including the struggles, not just the triumphs, but including the struggles, so that now we have more human connectedness, human collaboration, and we can grow to like be better and do better, you know, um, for ourselves and for each other. And so, um, yeah, I'm hoping that it'll move in that direction. But to be honest, right now, I think we're still um, struggling through um, both shame and also not using love languages that are really important to help us heal and grow and understand each other um, the way that we really need to fully, you know. Um, so uh, hopefully, um, you know, discussions like this will move us in that direction, you know, because I even know for myself, like, you know, I started, um, I did therapy a long time ago, but after last year, I went back to therapy and I started having a lot of conversations with my mom about, you know, like, I think you deserve the healing and the space for you to share what it's like to be a parent of two gay sons, uh, to be uh, an immigrant, <laughs> to, you know, to leave your country alone with your sister and land here, um, you know, to have your own you know, uh, ch unique challenges that only you know and experience and to have that space. And so it's interesting even now, like thinking about my mom who's aging, like I want her to have all the support, not just physically from her doctor and medically, but even just emotionally, psycho you know, psychologically, psychosocially, you know, and have that healing. And so I, I hope um, maybe it's going to be us by example, sharing what's working for us. Maybe it's going to spark our, you know, change in my, our immigrant parents. But I know for myself, it's very hard, you know, as, as much as like, I want it for her unless she wants it for herself. You know what I mean? It's not going to happen. But I actually believe it's possible. You know, I think it's possible because all my siblings were all like, all right, let's all <laughs> let's all share our testimonials about how journaling, therapy, talking to your friends, <laughs> you know what I mean, about what you're really going through. All these things that we're doing is helping us heal and, and move forward um, because these are all things that none of those things my parents do. Like they, they only talk to their friends about a certain amount of things. Uh, only the, the children, we were the only ones who really know some of those things. Uh, but I hope that narrative will change, you know. Um, maybe it starts with us individually um, talking about our stories. And then maybe they'll be like, oh, yeah, maybe I want to dip into that too, you know. Um, I guess we'll see, you know. And I know I'm lucky right now to have had people older than me and younger than me inspire me to choose something better for myself uh, because I have my own intergenerational trauma and things that I carry and different parts I'm healing. Um, but it's been the inspiration of people younger than me and older than me um, that have kind of made me move in the direction of even caring for myself too. So I guess we'll see. <laughs>
So awesome. Thank you for, for shedding color into all of it. I mean, that was just really amazing and special in terms of the, the work that you do, the perspective that you, and just even the intention behind everything that you do is it's just awe-inspiring. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks so much for sharing Arnell I really was really feeling that like the more that we heal ourselves the more that our everyone around us including our parents are going to recognize that and it's like we're all connected to our DNA is connected to them our ancestors everyone who goes who's coming um, is gonna feel like what we're working on so I feel really inspired by your work and I hope that uh, folks in the community that are listening can uh, reach out to you if you have any other resources uh, about occupational therapy or just researches about neurodivergent individuals. I know that uh, Claire, Claire and Rena shared some, but um, yeah, yeah how can uh, folks get a hold of that support? First of all, I love Claire and Rena, so check out their episode because it was awesome. <laughs> Lots of resources and ideas there. Um, but to, to connect with me, um, I'm very active on Instagram. <laughs> so it's just um, at Arnell Calvario. And then my link tree on my Instagram bio has kind of more links to just different things I'm doing and different programs and different interviews. This will, this interview will be, that link will also, um, this podcast will also be on my link tree as well. So you can check that out if you, if you're curious or you want to connect. That's awesome. Cool. Um, I'm going to ask you this, Arnel. So, you know, you are like the super being, the soup, you have all these superpowers, right? Um, I want to know just exactly how you are able to stay balanced, right? You had mentioned that you had gone from, from the hospital to, to the school and now being able to find fine tune your day-to-day fine-tune like what matters to you the most especially from everything that we've gone through the past couple of years like how do you find solace in your space and stay balanced well one of the tenets i kind of really believe in is finding the balance between making things happen and letting things happen so knowing that sometimes we're going to take charge in life and sometimes we're going to need to have faith and leave space for things to also unfold as they are meant to be. Um, I used to be the doer <laughs> and the maker and, you know, wanting to have control. And once I let go of control a little more and allowed for things to unfold and sometimes surprise me and in, in, in good and bad ways, um, I think I was just a lot healthier and happier. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is embracing my intersectional identity, knowing that I'm not ever meant to be one thing, but I'm actually a bunch of different things that connect with each other. And so I think once I've fully embraced, and I'm still on the journey towards understanding the different parts of my identity, um, I think that that work has actually been centering because as I, instead of choosing a label or choosing one aspect, actually knowing that how they intersect and connect with the other and understanding that more has actually centered me a little bit more. Um, and I, I realized <laughs> that um, I deserve the way I care for other people. I deserve that for myself. And um, that was a long, you know, I'm 48, just turning 49. And it took um, over 30 years of that amount of time for me to get to that space. It, I didn't come out till I was 31. Um, but um, when I started like coming out to, you know, when I came out to the world and to my friends, I started practices like journaling, <laughs> therapy. I'm a real big advocate for therapy now because this past year doing therapy has actually unlocked a lot of healing. <laughs> um, uh, and then doing things that, oh, one thing too is um, I don't I don't just dance for other people. I'm I've come full circle to where I started with dance because when I first started dancing, I used to dance in my room by myself. So I danced for myself, 
uh, I've come back to that person um, where I'm thinking about my intersectional identities and then picking dance art forms that meet who I am today. Um, so queer dance forms, liberating art forms, dance art forms, affirming <laughs> dance art forms. And one of them is house, which actually I've been meaning to ask Richie for a private um, because I'm... I've, I'm more of an expert in like locking and hip hop, but now I'm de delving into house because of liberation and community connection. After the pandemic, I realized I need that for my journey now. And so I'm back to that child that's just um, wants to be free again. And I feel like I'm the most balanced I've ever been in my entire life last year into this moment. Um, so so yeah, that I think the key is like embracing all of who you are and choosing things that help you, you know, learn and unlearn into your best version of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. So as we been begin to close, Arnell, how um, can people find out more about the dance therapy program? Mm -hmm. uh, for children and also any other additional uh, resources for um, OT? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for occupational therapy, I mean, we're lucky. In California, there's so many programs now. Um, I'm, an, uh, I'm an alumni of USC, <laughs> so you can always travel there. They're, the national organization is AOTA. Um, so that's like where you, if you want to find about OT in general, uh, American Occupational Therapy Association is a great resource. All the definitions of everything related to OT are there. Um, if we're trying to delve into autism, uh, my recommendation, <laughs> there's a lot of big organizations out there, but my best resource has actually been organizations that actually involve autistic people. Uh, one of the my favorite organizations is the Autism Self Advocacy Network. Uh, I did a fundraiser my last birthday for that um, nonprofit because um, you know the board of directors, a lot of the operations directors are autistic people, and I always feel when you have the blend of parents of autistic people, autistic people themselves, and then other people um, collaborating in, that's the best because um, now you have different lens doing great work that is hopefully going to expand, you know, um, you know, wellness for all. So um, I would say uh, those are my main places I would point in. And if for, uh, and then for me, you already have my Instagram. I if you have specific questions, just hit me up on Instagram, direct message me, and I'll try to find something more specific for what you're looking for. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you, Arnell, for talking to, you know, our beautiful, amazing, huge community globally about your, your expertise, your scope, your intention, your mindset, um, all things occupational therapy, neurodiversity, um, and obviously for this month, as we really go deep in autistic acceptance month, right? You know, we just like, I have the goosies right now, you know, because, you know, just having, just having you in the space has just been an honor and being able to learn from you and, and, and hear um, your journey. And so we're just really excited that you're here and just witness your, your journey as it still continues. Like you are, leaving your mark you're leaving your stamp and your legacy is still still continuing on so we want to do everything we can and and in all capacity to support you now as part of our philippine x and wellness family thank you so so much for you know those kind words and cheryl safa and ryan like i also just want to also give you your flowers um, because what we were talking about earlier of dispelling stigma and also moving towards collaboration and growth, um, programs like this, Philippinex Wellness, are necessary. And so I just want to give you all kudos for um, the time that you're donating, <laughs> you know what I mean, and investing to really open people's minds and hearts because these are conversations that aren't out there and I feel like it's really gonna help people. So I'm just wishing you a lot of continued uh, meaningful abundance and also thanking you for your work and 
um, yeah, I'm happy and proud to be connected and to continue to be part of the growth. So much love. Thank you so much, Arnaud, for that. And to our listeners, look out for our next pre-recorded session that we will air on both ours and SoCal Filipinos YouTube channels on Wednesday, May 11. We'll be featuring Joanna Galvez of Malaya Midwifery to talk to us about midwifery as we prepare for Mother's Day. Awesome. Yes. So as we as we start to close, um, we'd like to say thank you and happy birthday again to our <laughs> guest speaker, Dr. Arnell. <laughs> uh, I'd also like to say thank you to our stage and tech manager for the evening, Cheryl Sampson Ramirez. Amazing. Um, our temporary social media intern, Kathleen Torrio, our co-host. SoCal Filipinos, our designer and beat maker, Richie, as always, dropping the beats. Um, and again, for your consent for using the tracks for our show. Um, also, like to give a um, welcome to our advisors, Allison de la Cruz, Ran de los Reyes, our community partners, um, this Filipino American Life Trek Table. Check them out as well. Um, and all of our community members for obviously for all of your shares, all of your contributions. Um, we're always, 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 we're here to share more about our guest offerings on our Instagram stories, um, a lot of our highlights and permanent access with uh, upcoming events. So again, as always, be sure to follow us at Philippine, Philippine X in Wellness on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter at Philippine X, the letter N. Well, um, so follow by the letters N and S. Always kind of jumbled up, right? But don't forget to continue to hit subscribe button on Philippine X and Wellness on our YouTube channel. And again, thank you all to our supporters. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Continue to take care of yourselves and each other. Salamat kid. Maraming salamat. <laughs> Daghang salamat. Maraming salamat.